is an informational hearing on workers' rights and religious employees after the Hosanna Tabor decision was issued. I appreciate everyone for coming here. This is an important issue that really looks at the constitutional protections of the church against actions by the government, but also in California has long had a strong history of, of protecting employee rights, and the Hosanna decision affects really both of those. This is a hearing to explore the topic, understand some of the issues and the sensitivities that have been created with the Hosanna decision and some recent decisions I know that <coughs> may be applying to some of the religious schools here in San Francisco as well as Oakland and in other places. So we appreciate everybody being here. Informational hearings are information gathering exercises, no decisions get made. There are often legislative ideas or concepts that can come out of an informational hearing and it is a very, very useful tool for oversight and information gathering for the legislature to be able to frame what are important issues for California. We have a great panel here to present, and then we'll open it up for public comment on the hearing. I do want to take a minute and mention that Assemblymember David Chu, in whose district I guess we are, had wanted to be there and due to some scheduling conflicts was not able to be here. His district director, uh, Jennifer Court, is here monitoring the hearing, and Jennifer, there you are, is uh, in the audience if people wanted to talk to her on behalf of Assemblymember Chu. And I do have a brief statement from the Assemblymember. He says, thank you to the Judiciary Committee and Assemblymember Ting for scheduling this important hearing on workers' rights and religious employers. As a graduate of Catholic High School, it was important for me to sign the February letter questioning the insertion of a morality clause in teachers' contracts. It makes sense for us to explore the issue in greater depth, and I look forward to working with my colleagues and all stakeholders on possible solutions. That is a statement by Assemblymember David Chu, who is also a member of this committee, the Judiciary Committee. Since we are here in San Francisco with Mr. Phil Ting's district as well, I invited him to sit on the dais and take part in this judiciary hearing as a colleague of mine and a friend in the legislature. I look forward to the conversation. And Mr. Ting? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Stone. Uh, I just wanted to thank you, and I wanted to thank your Judiciary Committee staff in particular for helping put on this hearing. Um, this hearing and this issue came about many, many months ago, obviously, when the Archdiocese here in San Francisco decided to try to insert a morality clause into the contracts of the teachers and the staff uh, for four high schools. And those four high schools um, are very, very precious to the entire Bay Area. They're extremely prestigious. They have a history of... Uh, really graduating many of our leadership within the city, but also throughout the area and throughout the state. Uh, and we really thought that it was important to try to understand how do we balance, again, in institutions' ability to have religious freedom, which is sacrosanct in our Constitution, while at the same time, how do we balance people's civil rights and employment rights at the, you know, who are employees and to ensure uh, all the employment protections that we have in the United States, all the employment protections we have here in California are really ultimately uh, protected. And, and frankly, I first got involved in this issue because of the sort of public outcry that came about from the parent community, from the teacher community, because they were worried about the impact this would have on those four very precious high schools that, again, are really seen as um, community fixtures here in the Bay Area. Uh, so again, I just want to thank you for coming today and holding the hearing here in San Francisco. And I just want to thank the four panelists for taking time out of their busy schedule to present. And I'm really uh, very much looking forward to the information presented and hopefully uh, finding a way to continue the path forward so that we can ultimately balance those two fundamental uh, fundamental issues around religious freedom and civil rights. Thank you. This committee staff's work does a great job of analyzing and framing every issue that comes before this committee, whether it's research on a bill or research and background research for a particular issue that we're doing an information hearing about. And Mr. Tom Clark, who is principal counsel for the Judiciary Committee, did, I think, an, an excellent job of laying out framing the history and the details of the court decision and the issue that's before us here today. So that is the framework from which we launch into the hearing that we have. We have 
four panelists. I'm going to call on them individually, I think, in the order that listed on the agenda, if that's all right. And I'll ask the four panelists to give us their presentation and then leave it open for questions from the committee from the dais and to have a little bit of conversation about issues that have come up. And then we'll open it up for public comment. So we'll start with Leslie Griffin, who is the William S. Boyd Professor of Law, University of Nevada, Las Vegas, at the, the William S. Boyd School of Law. Ms. Griffin. Mr. Chairman, Assemblyman Ting, Mr. Clark, thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak with you about the First Amendment. And I'd like to organize my remarks around three issues. First, the ministerial exception. Second, the morality clauses. And then third, how those morality clauses possibly could link up with the ministerial exception. Now, our starting point is the First Amendment. And First Amendment case law is clear under Supreme Court precedent that under the Free Exercise Clause, everybody must follow neutral laws of general applicability. And the California Supreme Court and the Supreme, U.S. Supreme Court have affirmed that principle. Free exercise means you must follow the law. That's why, for example, in the older Catholic Charities case, right, the California Supreme Court said that Catholic Charities had to follow the Women's Contraception Act because that's a neutral law of general applicability. Now, as its name suggests, the ministerial exception is an exception to the general rule. And so the general rule is everybody must follow the law. The ministerial exception is an exception that the court has said is required by the First Amendment. And the context in which the ministerial exception arises is in the midst of a lawsuit. It's what lawyers technically call an affirmative defense. And so an employee of a religious organization goes to court. And at that point, the employer says, no, you're a minister. And if that person is a minister, it's a silver bullet. That It's an affirmative defense that ends the lawsuit. And so what happened in the Hosanna Tabor case is that the Supreme Court said a disabilities discrimination lawsuit was dismissed because the employee, Cheryl Parrish, was a minister. Now, we have just one Supreme Court case on the ministerial exception, but in the lower courts and in the state courts, the ministerial exception has been used to dismiss every type of discrimination case there is. Racial discrimination, sexual discrimination, national origin, sexual orientation, wage acts, um, family medical leave acts. So any anti-discrimination statute that you have, you could lose your lawsuit if the employee is a minister. And so that's why it's a big exception right to the rule of, well, the law applies unless the employee is a minister. Now, uh, you can see that if you had every employee as a minister, the ministerial exception would quickly swallow the rule of the anti-discrimination laws. And that's why it's very important to figure out who is a minister. Now, in Hosanna Tabor itself, the court said that they were going to make a very fact-specific determination so that what you, in every case you have to look at the facts and look at what the employee did. And in Hosanna Tabor itself, it's important to note that the employee had done some things voluntarily. She had taken courses that made her a called teacher. She had had extra training that made her a called instead of a lay teacher. And she also claimed ministerial status on her tax return. And so in those specific circumstances, the employee was the minister. Now, what's happened post Hosanna Tabor is that you have some strategy to turn many employees into ministers. For example, the Southern Baptist Convention released a document called Protecting Your Ministry from Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity Lawsuits. And so what would happen, right, is that if an employer is able to turn employees into ministers, then they would lose the protection of the anti-discrimination laws. Now, uh, I think there are many kinds of legal problems with employers trying to turn all their employees into ministers. And so you look back and you say, well, could you write, ask a non-Catholic in a Catholic school or a non-Baptist in a Baptist school and say that person is a minister? So far, the courts that have decided cases have said, no, that goes too far. But the problem with putting the word minister in a contract is what? You might violate the free exercise rights of the employees. You might discriminate against them on the basis of religion. And at a certain point, 
you would trip up against the Establishment Clause, right? If all the religious organizations could denominate their employees ministers, you could have a huge chunk of life and right, a huge number of people who suddenly fell outside the protection of the anti-discrimination laws. And so I think it's very important that the court has said, for a good reason, right, the ministerial exception is very fact-specific. Because the danger in having, oh, everybody can be turned into a minister by contract, would be that you'd have a huge amount of people who maybe not even voluntarily, depending on what the pressure of contract negotiations or the protection of at-will employees, right? If suddenly anybody could name an employee a minister, you would have too many employees losing their anti-discrimination protection. And I go back to where I started, right? The free exercise clause is supposed to be the law applies to everybody. The ministerial exception needs to be narrow, it should, right, it traditionally covers people who what, would voluntarily enter the ministry in some way. Now, uh, the second point is about these morality clauses. And, uh, you know, I'm thinking that if you're a sports, a sports fan like I am, you'd think, oh, well, we hear about morals clauses all the time in contracts, right? It's part of endorsements. And, uh, right, and Mr. Clark, as your, as your memo excellently points out, right, public school teachers traditionally have morality clauses. And so I think we're, it's easy to think, oh, morality clauses, right, everybody has them, right? Sports people who want contracts, public school teachers. But I think that the question here is more nuanced. First of all, as you know, for public school teachers, the court has said, well, you know, the morality clauses have to be linked to their employment, right? It's not everything they do in their personal lives. And I think for any morality clause, it's really important to look at the content of the morality clause. And what we see across the country in Cincinnati or Cleveland or in the places that have proposed morals clauses is that they've been focused on constitutional rights, same-sex marriage, same-sex partnerships, in vitro fertilization and other reproductive technologies, and in one case, a transgender teacher. And I suggest that the idea of a morality clause in an employment contract that reaches constitutional rights needs to be viewed very carefully and thought of differently. Now, uh, my own sense is that such morality clauses, right, going to privacy rights, going to marriage, would violate Title VII, right, because what they would uh, be a form, they could be a form of sex discrimination. I think that there are also provisions in, our, in the California Constitution that say privacy, right? California, all California citizens enjoy the right to privacy, even against private employers. And the kinds of morals clauses we're talking about here deeply touch upon privacy protection, right? Reproductive freedom, sexual liberty, marriage, the right to marry, right? Which is a, a, a fundamental right. And so I think in any analysis that we do of morality clauses, it's hard because the law is so kind of tricky on the athlete who's agreeing to a promotion or the public school teacher who did a certain thing. But morality clauses about constitutional rights really need to be reviewed differently. And I think if you look at numerous provisions of the labor and contract laws, you think at a certain point, contracts that ask people to give up their constitutional rights or contract negotiations that ask people to give up their, their constitutional rights can be very problematic in terms of what's the balance in protecting people's constitutional freedoms, right? We have an important commitment to First Amendment religious freedom, but we also have important commitments to reproductive privacy and, of course, now to same-sex marriage, as a fun <coughs> to marriage, right? No longer same-sex marriage, to marriage as a fundamental right. And so morals clauses that, that uh, run up against those rights are, are a trouble. And just briefly, let me end by saying another thing that morals clauses can be used to do, it goes back to the public school teachers, right? Sometimes the morals clauses for public school teachers are linked to the idea that teachers are role models. And because they're role models, they have to behave morally. Now, who's a role model in the religious world? Well, a minister. And so, in a way, the more morality clauses that you can add into a contract, the more likely it could be that an employee could be viewed as a role model, but a religious role model is a minister. And so, whether the contract says minister or not, you know, a contract doesn't have to say minister to make you a minister. But if you have enough religious duties or religious obligations under a contract, then you can pick up the status of a minister. And so that's the odd connection, right? Because the ministerial exception, you don't want it to swallow the rule of the anti-discrimination laws. 
the court has said it's a fact-specific exception. If we go too far, the exception will swallow the rule. And there are many ways to swallow the rule, not just by putting the word minister in a contract, but by putting other kinds of language that suggest that everything that teachers do is religious. So uh, I thank you for inviting me, and uh, thanks for uh, giving me a chance to speak to you, and I look forward to your questions later. Thank you. You do raise a lot of questions, so <laughs> keeping track of those. All right, Jeffrey Berman, attorney at law with Safe Earth Shaw LLP in Los Angeles. Welcome. Okay, thank you. Um, I am a labor lawyer, but even though I'm a labor lawyer, I file briefs in a lot of uh, religion cases, including Hosanna Tabor. University of Great Falls, Montana, um, Pacific Lutheran University, and the California Supreme Court, the McKeon case, the CHW case, um, the uh, Bonds case, the historic marking case, uh, East Bay Asian, um, and others. Um, so I, I'm a labor lawyer, but I do a lot of other things that have to do with religion, some of which are employment, some of which are not. For 45 years, um, I graduated in 71, um, I've represented, um, for most of the people in this room were born, frankly, um, for 45 years, I've represented religions, religious schools, religious hospitals, and other types of religious entities. I'm familiar with the way many of them operate, um, the religious work that they perform, and their need for and their constitutional right to religious autonomy, which includes defining who will be their spokespersons or their ministers and the right to select them. I'd like to start with a few preliminary remarks. That there are some who believe that Hosanna Tabor was wrongfully decided, or wrongly decided. That the fact of the matter is, is that that is um, not really an issue. Because whether you believe that Hosanna Tabor was decided correctly or not, it was decided, and it was decided 9-0. So it is, it is the law of the land. Um, as an aside, it's one of the few cases um, on an issue that was potentially divisive, but turned out not to be divisive, uh, where there was unanimity. If you look at many of the cases that come up, including the same-sex marriage cases, they tend to be four to five. So this was very unusual to have all nine justices agree on something. Now, there are some that say what Hosanna Tabor does is that it permits unlawful discrimination. And that's not true. And the reason that that's not true is because the ministerial exception is just a form of an exemption. And all of the statutes that we deal with have exemptions. <coughs> Government employees are exempted from the Fair Employment and Housing Act. Airlines are exempted from the National Labor Relations Act. Agricultural <coughs> employees are exempted from a lot of laws. So that what that means is that the legislature, in most cases, has determined that we're going to enact a law. It's going to say some things are discriminatory, but we are going to specifically exempt people, and we're going to let those people engage in acts that we're not going to let others engage in. So all Hosanna Tabor is a constitutionally required exemption. So if you look at that that way, then you're not looking at the employer engaging in unlawful discrimination because it's there's no law that applies to them. They have just an exception or an exemption. Um, the ministerial exemption or exception has a stronger basis than the statutory exemptions. The statutory exemptions are voted by legislatures. They, they sometimes are changed. Things are added. Things are taken away. But this exception or exemption is constitutionally compelled and can't be changed by any legislature, um, whether it's a state legislature or the federal government. Now, the purpose of the religious schools is to foster, it's obviously to teach, but it's also to foster spiritual growth, to inculcate religious beliefs and values, and to help the student grow as a person um, intellectually and spiritually. Um, they have in common with the public schools the basic education, but they are much different than the public schools because of the spiritual factor that they try to inculcate in their students. The schools are parts of the church. They are an integral part of the religion that sponsors the, the various schools. And the teachers have to at least respect the beliefs of the, um, of the school and of the religion in order to be effective role models. As a matter of fact, in some of the schools, depending on what religious uh, tradition you're from, it's an act of proselytization. So it's not just to 
make people you know uh, good students and to bring them closer to the religion but to take other people who are not members of the religion and make them part of the religion so i've been in many many third world countries and as you go around to the sort of countries you see many of our religious organizations establishing schools there and the purpose is to proselytize and to bring new members in and, um, now the different um you know uh, religions uh, have different views, but they are all fairly consistent. And I just want to read what some of the, the major mainstream religions say about the role of their schools. Uh, because I've said, you know, that yes, they have a spiritual function, but you don't want to believe a lawyer, obviously. You want to hear what the religions have to say. So what the Lutherans say is that we have educators who model spiritual leadership. They study God's word. They share their personal faith story. They apply the law and the gospel, and they equip the students to act courageously um, and to be God's people for service and care of others. The Baptists, one of the found factors that distinguishes a Christian college from a secular institution is the attention given to and the value placed on spiritual growth. That colleges and universities that emphasize spiritual growth and development alongside intellectual and professional growth will be uh, places where a student stands the best chance of becoming all God wants him or her to be. The Adventists. Education in its broadest sense is a means of returning human beings to their original relationship with God. The aim of true education is to restore human beings into the image of God. So when teachers take these positions, they are fully aware of the religious nature of the school and they know what to expect. Um, I'm a lawyer. When I became a lawyer and I joined my law firm, I knew what to expect. Um, if I am a student who's looking to go to school, I go on the school's website and I read what the school has to say about itself, I know what to expect. If I am an applicant for employment to be a teacher at a religious school, I look on the website and I know what to expect. The rules are there. The faith-based nature of the school um, is there. Now, the term uh, minister um, has been applied broadly, more than just an ordained minister or a credentialed minister. Um, it's been applied by the various courts, and this was not in Hosanna Tabor, to music directors, choir directors, um, seminarians who engaged in uh, uh, maintenance, um, administrators, um, uh, and a kosher supervisor, and of course, like in Hosanna Tabor, to, uh, to teachers. So the ministerial exemption is something that is broader than what we consider to be a traditional um, minister or a credential minister or chaplain. Um, now, if you look at Hosanna Tabor, um, <coughs> Hosanna Tabor, um, according to the court, spent most of her time teaching, yet it concluded based upon the facts that she had enough functions speaking for the church that she came under the um, exception. And um, um, Alito and Kagan, in their um, concurring opinion, acknowledged that teachers um, um, of the faith can qualify as ministers. So we've got a specific ruling of the Supreme Court applying to one teacher, and we've got two of the more liberal justices acknowledging that teachers of the faith in the abstract can qualify um, for the ministerial exception. And as you probably know, the ministerial exception has been long standing in California, uh, much before Hosanna Tabor and the, and the Chapman University case and also in the, the Red Hill case. Now, teachers qualify for the ministerial exception um, because they are role models and they fulfill the religious mission of the school. And this is something that we call faith integration. And in many of the religious schools, or there is an effort, probably most of the religious schools, there is an effort to integrate faith in the classroom. And this is a hard concept to, to understand. So if you look at Biola University, which is a non-denominational Christian university, they say, in describing its anthropology department, that the anthropology major seeks to provide a holistic understanding of the diversity of human behavior across time and culture through a distinctly Christian worldview. Why choose chemistry at Biola? Integrate, the reason is we integrate biblical training and Christian uh, perspective with science. 
Um, and you can look at many of the other schools, the religious schools, right on their websites, and you can see that when they describe the most basic of courses, the science courses or the history courses, they're talking about that this is not the same kind of class that you're going to get at the University of California, that this is a class which is going to be infused with religion. If you go to the Azusa Pacific University um, website, which is a non-denominational evangelical university in Southern California, you'll see that they have an entire office of faith integration, and they have, um, in, they have a faculty faith integration handbook, which is 81 pages long, which tells the faculty members as to what they're supposed to do to bring faith into the class, even into classes that have topics that most of us would never think would have uh, any faith-based um, uh, aspects of it. So if you look at their faculty handbook, and this is separate from their faith-based uh, handbook, it says that faith integration is informed reflection on and discovery of Christian faith within the academic disciplines. And it's in order to advance the work of God in the world. So what we have is we've got people who some of us may think of as just teaching normal topics like history or geology or something that would have no faith um, uh, counterpart, but we see that the Christian schools and the other <laughs> religious schools believe that their purpose is to infuse religion into the classroom, and you've got the teachers being responsible for being the spokespeople or the spokesperson for the religion. Now, it <coughs> is well... Bless you. Bless you. It is... I hope that was okay to say bless you, Excuse me. Give, given the topic. Right. <laughs> uh, Gesundheit. Um, that um, it's been constitutionally recognized for a long time, even before Hosanna Tabor, that a religious institution has the right to select its own ministers and that this is constitutionally um, compelled. And under the Hosanna Tabor case, it's not only the establishment clauses and the free exercise clause, but it's freedom of association. And if you read Hosanna Tabor, this concept of being able to designate your own spokesman if you're a religion and religious autonomy goes back to the Magna Carta. Um, so it's not something that we made up when we put together our constitution. It goes back to England well before we were a country. And in Hosanna Tabor, um, it became clear that the government can't dictate matters of church governance. They can't, the government can't dictate who's going to speak for the church. The government can't dictate the church's mission, that the church has the right to decide who will uh, carry its beliefs to the others. And as much as a legislative body, be it state or federal, might want to extend anti-discrimination to uh, areas where the ministerial exception would apply, that's constitutionally prohibited. It just, it just can't be done. Um, now, the majority in Hosanna Tabor um, looked at the facts. They said, we're not going to give you a bright line test. And per Professor Griffin noted that, too. They looked at a whole lot of facts involving um, the plaintiff in that case. Um, Justice Thomas, in his own concurring opinion, um, came up with a test. His test was that the exception applies to schools that consider teachers as a minister. Um, and Alito and Kagan, in the other um, concurring opinion, noted that ordination was not required, but that what they said you need to do is to look at the teacher's duties, um, and those would be critical in per, uh, whether they're critical in performing the mission and spreading the message of the group. There is, in labor law, because remember I'm just a labor lawyer, um, there is a concept that we have called the University of Great Falls, Montana. And the University of Great Falls, Montana, um, is an NLRB case involving assertion of jurisdiction over religious schools. And uh, the U.S. Supreme Court has said that um, you cannot, you, the NLRB cannot do that. And um, the NLRB has uh, disregarded that, and they've gone up to the circuit several times. And in Great Falls, what the, uh, what the court said, the D.C. Circuit, and it's been followed, is that what we're going to do to determine whether a school is religious or not and whether they fall under what's called the Catholic Bishop of Chicago exception case. It's, not, it's, like, it's like an exemption, <coughs> but it's not. It's constitutionally required, like Hosanna Tabor is, that what we're going to do is we cannot troll through the religious beliefs of the school. We can't go in there with a shovel and start digging around to see really how religious are they. 
Um, what we're going to do is we are going to look at how does the school hold itself out. And if the school holds itself out as being religious, we are not going to look behind that. And, and I would suggest that the same standard should be for the ministerial exception, that you take the, the, the D.C. Circuit case in Great Falls, which says you can't troll through their beliefs. We're going to have to take um, as faith what, what they say and that you apply it in this context, too. Um, now, in summary, then, the Supreme Court has ruled unanimously that religious schools have the right to designate who's a minister, who performs their ministerial function, including teachers, and that any effort to deprive them of that right is barred by the First Amendment. Um, thank you very much for your time.